way uh, throughout this Tuesday morning for you today. Yeah, and of course, uh, the bank holiday weather might have helped lots of businesses. It was the hottest day of the year mm -hmm. yesterday, as Carol was saying. Was it enough to help attractions and tourist businesses get back on their feet? Uh, Visit Britain says domestic tourism is recovering slowly, though. Uh, Nina's in Liverpool for us this morning. Wait till you see this. Yes. Oh, I, I was wondering whether you'd get out there, Nina. Good on you. What did you what did you think, Dan? You know me well enough by now. Uh, good morning from Liverpool's Roller Dome. Uh, roller Disco's been happening here over the weekend. I've got to say, I've not skated for 25 years, but you never lose it. Um, and this was packed in a socially distanced way, so the numbers were here, but not as many as at full capacity. What was important for this place, like many across the country, was that it was its first time of opening. And Laura, here she is was telling me that actually the roadmap gave them a chance to get things just right. Hello, congratulations on your opening. Oh, thank you. How was it? Yeah, it was really good, really great success. Everyone really enjoyed it. <laughs> really great reception, we're going to crash. <laughs> How do you do things like make sure people are distanced in an environment like this? Because you kept the numbers low, didn't you? We kept the numbers really low, we make sure everyone's wearing a mask, everyone stays skating in their own groups and yeah, it went really well. It felt, felt safe, but also really fun. Such a lovely thing to do, isn't it? Um, yeah. You skate on, because um, let me tell you <laughs> how things are looking uh, long term. So around a quarter of us are planning a UK day trip over the next couple of weeks. And with that, we spend money, don't we? And over the next month or so, over that time, a lot of us are feeling brave. Around half of us planning an overnight stay somewhere. But look at this impact on revenue generated. Even with this burst of spend, it means numbers are a lot lower than they were pre-pandemic. And the crucial months of July, August and September, the bookings are down at the moment. Look who's here, a hotelier. Andrew, lovely to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Big weekend for you. City Centre Hotel. How did it go? It was really busy. We were really, really pleased with it. It was uh, a lot busier than we anticipated. So oh, was ev it? everyone seemed genuinely, genuinely relieved to, to be out and about. And was it a different sort of visitor? Because I took an overnight stay over this weekend mm -hmm. a mile from my house because I just yeah. thought, do you know what, just to get away from home and make the most of it. Yeah, it was. It was, it was a mixture, to be honest. It was, we had a lot of local people just simply looking for a change of scenery to uh, sleep in a different bed, have some room service and, you know, eat in the bar and restaurants and things like that. And people just trying out different parts of the UK at the exactly. moment, aren't they? Tell me about your concerns going forward, though, because we've heard the numbers. Only about a third of bookings in those crucial months of July and August have taken place. Confidence is not what it could be, is it? No, it's not. I mean, we've seen weekend demand is still good, because yeah. I, I do still think people will travel around the UK and will still want to see the attractions. It's, it's the weekdays. Um, it's what the live events bring, that demand and that, that revenue boost to the city. I think that it really is key to be getting the... the crowds back in the stadiums. So it's the, a big football match, it's, it's, it's the arena tours. Yeah, exactly. And tell me, because we've seen pictures of places up and down the UK absolutely hammered with people arriving. Mm -hmm. How do you keep people safe when they're excited, they've had a drink, they're out again for the first time? It's tough, but I mean, it's for us as a venue to make, feel, make feel, people feel comfortable, put all the measures in place so they can relax when they're here. But everyone's generally been really good with the rules. Well, good luck with the com what months coming up. Thank you. Laura, Hello. One, la oh! one last question. Any tips for going backwards? Um, just got to get in the groove. OK, just get in the <laughs> groove, just like that. So that's what I'll try and do for the next uh, hit. Ah! Just get constant practice. Yeah, like everything, 10,000 yeah. hours, isn't Start it? I'm not sure I've got that long. But look at those feet. And, and obviously, at the moment, as you'll be talking about this morning, uh, Dan and Sally is all eyes on the government. We don't necessarily know whether the roadmap will be completed on the 21st of June as planned. But in the meantime, aren't we all just making the most of doing what we can while we can? Oh, Nina, you are so brave. Well done. At 20 past six in the morning, going round and round in a disco. I want to see you going backwards by the it, end of the morning, know, Nina. I'm I reckon you've got it. Ball. It's been too long. I think Nina's enjoying that a bit too much. I think you're enjoying that a bit too <laughs> no, it's much. Good. Very
this programme. Yeah, yeah, let's move on swiftly. Now, high-polluting vehicles will be charged to drive into the centre of Birmingham from today. Uh, this is part of the city's new clean air zone, which will see cars, taxis and vans pay £8 for entry per day. Our chief environment correspondent, Justin Rowlett, is in Birmingham for us this morning. Uh, Justin, good morning to you. So, day one, uh, exactly uh, talk us through how it will work. Well, I'll come on to that, but first I'm here to bring you a new word. It's a word you're going to get very familiar with. It is CAZ, C-A-Z, Clean Air Zone. And these clean air zones, these CAZs, are coming to a town or city near you. Why? Well, we know lots of our cities have issues with air pollution. And back in March, the government was successfully prosecuted for failing to meet standards for a particular gas, nitrogen dioxide, really nasty air pollutant, that's very bad for your health. CASs are the response to that. Here's how it's going to work here in Birmingham. From this morning, if you drive through the city in a polluting car, you are going to be charged. Now, there are signs all around the city. You've got these, uh, these cameras here to catch you. And if you're in a private car or a taxi, you're going to pay eight quid. If you're in a bus or a lorry, you're going to pay 50 quid, the owner of the bus or lorry. There are some exemptions if you earn less than £30,000 a year, for example. And that's one of the issues. These CASs are being introduced at different times around the country and they all have a slightly different rules, as I've been discovering. Bath does not look like a revolutionary place with its Georgian terraces and Roman baths. But back in March, Bath kicked off a nationwide transport transformation when it became the first city outside London to introduce one of these clean air zones. But unlike in Birmingham, there will be no charges for polluting private cars here. Commercial vans and taxis, which don't meet emission standards, will pay £9. HGVs and buses that don't will pay £100. So how come polluting private cars don't pay? Well, cities are different from one another. They have different geographies and they have different levels of pollution to start with. So that's where the modelling has told us that we don't need to charge cars and should be compliant by the end of this year without. Bath bus operator First Group says the introduction of the CAS persuaded it to bring forward plans to upgrade all its vehicles to meet the new standards but residents on some busy roads outside the new clean air zone say they're getting more HGV traffic as drivers change routes to avoid the charges. It is a different story 150 miles away in Nottingham. Here, any vehicle can drive through the city because Nottingham cancelled its plans for a clean air zone. That's not because Nottingham is a dirty city, quite the opposite. Its buses run on biogas created from food and farm waste. It has a fleet of zero-emission electric taxis, an electric tram network, and has already reconfigured the roads to encourage fewer cars to drive into the centre and persuade more people to take public transport. We've been on a path towards cleaner air for a long time. We implemented um, some anti-congestion measures. For example, we introduced the workplace parking levy, which was a charge on parking spaces at workplaces. It's helped us to develop a really integrated public transport system, which is very popular with people, and therefore they're less likely to bring their car into work. Which goes to show that there are lots of different ways that our towns and cities can clean up their air. We're back in Birmingham. I'm joined by Nigel Humphreys, who is an op opponent of this clean air zone, this CAS. Nigel, why don't you support getting rid of air pollution? Well, we think this zone is going to catch a lot of people out with the fines because uh, they don't know about it, despite all the publicity, especially people from outside the city. Uh, as for the locals, uh, it's going to affect poorer drivers It's good because they've got the older cars that have to pay this charge. Uh, and uh, that's unfair, uh, we think, on, on those people. Although there is this uh, exemption for people under earning under £30,000 a year. Well, that is for people who work in the zone, and uh, there's going to be a lot of people who maybe live one side of the zone and work the other side, and they are going to be caught out by it. And what they're going to do is they're going to drive around the ring road and divert, creating more congestion, more pollution, and wasting time and money. 
So there you go, Nigel, thank you very much indeed. There you go, Dan. It looks to me as if these clean air zones, these CASs, are going to be pretty controversial. OK, new word to learn, CAS. Thank you very much yeah. for that, Justin. We'll see a bit... Help attractions and businesses get back on their feet. Uh, Visit Britain says domestic tourism is recovering, uh, but slowly. Nina is in Liverpool. She's not going to do a flip for us, but she is on <laughs> wheels this morning. Morning, Nina. I want to reflect. Yes, good morning. Welcome to 1987. No, I'm only joking. Uh, to Liverpool's roller drome. Uh, newly opened last weekend. The tills have been ringing well. Uh, but is it enough? Has it been enough to make up revenue overall? Let's speak to Chris, if I can. Handbrake stop. Who works <laughs> in tourism in Liverpool? Not what you expected this morning, was it, Chris? No, no. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, it has been a bumper weekend. The big yeah. question now is where we go from here. Yeah, it's been a great weekend. We've been delighted to see our pubs, our bars, our hotels fully booked for the for the weekend. But like you say, it's, it's a long haul. You know, we've got a long way to go. Uh, it's been a difficult time for the sector. We've lost two billion pounds a year on year and 20,000 jobs. So it's a long road ahead. But if any city can come through this strong, it's Liverpool. So busy all across the UK over the weekend yeah. in those tourist hotspots, just like Liverpool. But you were saying going forward when it comes to July, August, September, there's a difference between lookers and bookers. Just explain. Yeah, what we're finding is that consumers are, are very keen to come to places like Liverpool, but they're conscious about the roadmap. They're worried yeah. about whether the restrictions will allow them to get their money back, to get refunds, to get cancellations effectively handled. So they're booking very late. And because they're booking very late, is therefore making the, the planning for business is very difficult. And that's, that's going to be continued really until June 21st. That's it, Chris, isn't it? It's about confidence. Um, let me tell you about going forward then. In the next couple of weeks, it looks like around a quarter of us whoo, have planned a day trip somewhere. Actually, have planned an overnight stay, but that revenue, this big burst of spend, is coming nowhere near where we were pre pandemic levels. Just look at those numbers. Whoo! And as Chris was just saying, the concern there is that people are looking but not booking, and that's because there is a bit of uncertainty around the road map ahead. Let's grab Laurie, who was part of the opening here, and is. Hi. You were desperately waiting, weren't you, for last Oh, we've got a casual... Oh, no, he's straight back up. What a pro. All right, all right. And so you straight back open at last weekend. Yeah. For the first time, actually. Yeah. Busy, busy. Yeah. Oh, well, as busy as it can be and whilst there's still restrictions, but it was just incredible just to be back open, just to, you know, have people back in the building and life again. It, was, it felt really positive for the whole team. Well, talk to me about the revenue when you do have restricted numbers, because you can't have many more than we've got now. What does that mean to take things? Um, I mean, yeah, it's... ..nothing at the moment, so yeah. we're just really happy to be getting people through the doors, you know, because... Previously, we were a music venue. Yeah. So this time last year, we were just, you know, free fall. We had no idea what we were going to do. But, um... So you feel optimistic, but you're, you're big in the art scene in Liverpool, in the Merseyside region. Yeah. Do you think the scarring that we've seen over the past 15, 16 months will be permanent? You didn't run. Um... Or do you think that spend will be back, that engagement with... The whole concept of a roller rink, it sort of was like, felt like something that we could do with restrictions. Chris was saying earlier, he works in tourism in the city and he's seeing more widely innovation, so new ideas perhaps wouldn't have happened. Speaking of trying new things, where is she? Laura promised to teach me to go backwards. Laura? She told me it would be easy, but let's go through it again. So you stop and then it's outwards. Do the bubble. Do the bubble. Yeah. She's a very skillful skater. Nina. I think she could probably do it just without the pressure of live television. Yes. I bet you she'll completely crack that Oof. in the next Thanks, half guys. Half. Yeah, we believe <laughs> in you, Nina. We believe in you. We've had a lot of jeopardy on the programme this morning, haven't we? Spot on today. It is part of the city's new clean air zone, which will see cars, taxis and vans pay £8 for entry per day. Our chief environment correspondent, Justin Rolat, is in Birmingham. Morning, Justin. Good morning. Yeah, I'm here to bring you a new word. It's a word we're all going to get quite familiar with, and the word is CAS. 
CAZ Clean Air Zones. Now we're going to get familiar with it because these clean air zones are being brought in in towns and cities around the country. Why is that? It's all about air pollution and in particular a nasty gas called nitrogen dioxide. The government's been prosecuted for not keeping levels of it low enough. CAZs are the response. What it means here in Birmingham is if you drive a polluting vehicle through town, car or taxi, you're going to pay eight quid. A bus or a lorry, you're going to pay 50 quid. There are some exemptions for people on low incomes. But these clean air zones are being introduced at different times around the country and they also have different rules, as I've been discovering. Bath does not look like a revolutionary place with its Georgian terraces and Roman baths. But back in March, Bath kicked off a nationwide transport transformation when it became the first city outside London to introduce one of these clean air zones. But unlike in Birmingham, there will be no charges for polluting private cars here. Commercial vans and taxis which don't meet emission standards will pay £9. HGVs and buses that don't will pay £100. So how come polluting private cars don't pay? Well, cities are different from one another. They have different geographies and they have different levels of pollution to start with. So that's where the modelling has told us that we don't need to charge cars and should be compliant by the end of this year without. Bath bus operator First Group says the introduction of the CAS persuaded it to bring forward plans to upgrade all its vehicles to meet the new standards. But residents on some busy roads outside the new clean air zone say they're getting more HGV traffic as drivers change routes to avoid the charges. It is a different story 150 miles away in Nottingham. Here, any vehicle can drive through the city because Nottingham cancelled its plans for a clean air zone. That's not because Nottingham is a dirty city, quite the opposite. Its buses run on biogas created from food and farm waste. It has a fleet of zero emission electric taxis, an electric tram network, and has already reconfigured the roads to encourage fewer cars to drive into the centre and persuade more people to take public transport. We've been on a path towards cleaner air for a long time. We implemented um, some anti-congestion measures. For example, we introduced the workplace parking levy which was a charge on parking spaces at workplaces. It's helped us to develop a really integrated public transport system which is very popular with people and therefore they're less likely to bring their car into work. Which goes to show that there are lots of different ways that our towns and cities can clean up their air. We're back here in Birmingham. I'm joined by Councillor Wasim Zafir, who is Birmingham's, uh, he's on the Birmingham Committee for Transport. You head it up as a, as a Cabinet member, don't you? Listen, other cities have managed not to charge cars. How come Birmingham's charging car drivers? We carried out some modelling uh, looking at a clean air zone that doesn't charge private cars. That quite clearly showed we wouldn't get to the legal limits that we are legally uh, required to do. Look, here in Birmingham, our air pollution problem is only second to London. Hundreds of Brummies are dying every year because of these illegal and unsafe levels of air quality. Yeah, but the point about this is, it's the poorer people who have the older vehicles, the poorer people who are most likely to pay the charges, aren't they, Zafir? So our £40 million grant package and our exemptions prioritises those low-income earners, anybody earning less than £30,000, the taxi drivers in the city, and those that live within the clean air zone. So we're providing those extra levels of support to those communities that desperately need to get the support to, in, with, with what is, without doubt, a challenging policy in our city. So how many people are going to end up paying these charges, do you estimate? So one in 10 people travelling into the city centre on any normal day in Birmingham will be impacted and approximately 25% of those travelling by car. So the vast majority of those travelling by car, three quarters, are driving compliant cars. They can go about their daily business without being impacted by this. 
The AA estimates possibly as many as 100,000 people will be caught in this charge. That's a lot of people paying charges, isn't it? So once we've uh, looked at those that are compliant and then the, concentrate on the exemptions and the financial incentives to support those who are non-compliant, um, I think there will be a, a smaller number of people who will be impacted by this. We don't want their money. We want people travelling into the city centre on green journeys that doesn't impact on air pollution in our city. Wasim Zafir, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm also joined now by Nigel Humphreys. Now, you're an opponent of this. You heard what Wasim said. They've got a really serious air pollution problem in Birmingham. They need to have restrictions, don't they? Uh, well, I don't believe that they do. I think if you look at where the, where the uh, air quality monitoring stations are put, they're put by the roadside. Uh, if you move further away from them, the uh, amount of pollution drops off quite rapidly. The legal limit is an annual average. Nobody is sitting by the curbside for the whole year. So I don't think it is necessary. The cars that are coming on are much, much better. They're much cleaner. The levels of this pollutants in the atmosphere are falling. And above all, when you buy a new car, especially a diesel car that the government has encouraged you to do so, then you should have a contract with them that you can use that car equally with other cars for the rest of its natural life, not have to pay extra charges when it's only gone through a third of its life. But the point is to get polluting vehicles off the road, isn't it? And that has to be a sensible thing. Well, as I say, that will happen through natural wastage anyway. But what's going to happen here is people who live and work on different sides of the zone are going to end up driving around, creating congestion and pollution just outside the zone. And that's going to be a shot in the foot. Nigel Humphreys, thank you very much indeed. Back to you in the studio. Justin, thanks very much indeed.